All right, welcome everybody to Stranded Knitting. My name is Dana and I'm the editor of Fave Crafts. I'll be emceeing today's class. Um, if you're not familiar with Fave Crafts, we are a website that shares free craft tutorials from all over the internet. We have a variety of free email newsletters broken down by interest like Easy Does Knit, Everyday Crochet, Trash to Treasure, and more. And you can sign up for any of our free newsletters at favecrafts.com. A few housekeeping items. We are recording today's class, and you'll get a copy of that recording emailed to you tomorrow in about 24 hours. So keep an eye on your inbox for an email from Favecrafts via Zoom. Uh, you can use the Q&A feature to ask questions or the chat. Sometimes the chat moves kind of quickly, um, but either place, you know, uh, we'll be monitoring both places to, to hopefully address all your questions throughout today's class. And then thank you so much to the Hands-On Knitting Center for sponsoring today's class. Today's class is taught by Molly Conroy of the Hands-On Knitting Center. Molly is a partner in Hands-On Knitting Center, a 12-year-old local yarn store in Redlands, California. She has been knitting for 16 years. HOKC is an inviting store with a large table in the middle where all are welcome to bring projects in and get help for free anytime. The atmosphere means that we fix a lot of knitting and do a lot of teaching. This experience led Molly to look for ways to simplify the teaching of seemingly complex knitting techniques. She teaches for HOKC, both online, like today, and in store, and has taught for stitches in many local guilds. Also, the Hands-On Knitting Center will be at the SoCal Fiber Fair in November. This is a brand new fiber celebration for knitters, crocheters, weavers, embroiderers, and yarn, enth and yarn enthusiasts across California to come together for a weekend of fun, friendship, and of course, lots and lots of fiber. So you can learn more when you visit the handsonknittingcenter.com or socalfiberfair.com. And I'll drop that link in the chat here uh, momentarily. Mm -hmm. So, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> and that is coming up, I think it's November 18, 19, that weekend. Correct. So, all right. Yeah. And I'll drop that link in the chat and, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Molly. Molly, thank you so much for teaching today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm always thrilled to do this. Teaching is my favorite thing that I get to do as a yarn shop owner. Um, I actually only and exclusively teach online now because I moved from Redlands, California to Independence, Oregon. And oh my goodness. Uh, I know. So, <laughs> and my partners were kind enough to allow me to, to uh, remain a partner. And so I do all of our online activity. Um, awesome. I'll, I'll be going back for the fiber fair, right? So there's some stuff I would do in person. Uh, you can't help but do that. Okay, so today we're talking um, about stranded knitting. So I love stranded knitting. Um, and stranded knitting is any knitting where you have the, I didn't leave in my ends, so don't mock me. Uh, any um, uh, knitting where you have these floats on the inside. So a lot of people ask me, what is the difference between ferrile knitting and stranded knitting? Um, and it's uh, ferrile is stranded. So not all stranded knitting is ferrile, but ferrile is stranded knitting. Um, and so ferrile is when you have a motif where your yarns change um, every two to yarn colors change every two to three rows. And they tend to be fairly uh, geometric um, motifs. So this is a ferrile motif, motif, but we are doing this the easy way because we are allowing the yarn to do all of the work for us um, in terms of changing the colors. So we use two yarns throughout this whole thing. In order to do that, you need yarns that have very long colorways because you can see how that yarn is ten tending to last about two to three rows, which is really what we're looking for that. So this yarn happens to be um, Earth's unique worsted uh, which is one of my favorite yarns for this, but by no means the only yarn that could be used. Um, and certainly those of you that make your own, uh, you could do some really cool stuff uh, to plan um, the uh, uh, the length right of the yarn. Okay, so the first thing, I'm such a firm believer that when you pick a pattern, um, that's just the start, right? So when you choose the pattern and you choose the yarn, you need to be really aware of what you're choosing and are you making the, the best decision. So obviously if you choose exactly what the pattern tells you to use, that's a little easier. But if you're making different choices, then you need to think about a couple of things. So number one, um, the earth worsted yarn, both in harvest and unique, tend to be very 
um, uh, very light, right? So these these yarns are not considered a heavy worsted or an errand worsted. They are on closer to that that in that spectrum from DK to worsted. They're closer to DK, so they would be considered a light worsted. So if you are choosing to use a different yarn, you would want to choose another light worsted. If you don't choose light worsted because you have the heavier, then you need to think about the size that you're going to make and the, um, the size of needle that you would use. So where I've seen some people get into trouble with this hat is they go to a bigger worsted. Um, they might even go up a needle size. They then still make that medium size and they make a ginormous hat. Um, so this is, I'm just going to try it on for you. This is a hat that's meant to be just a little bit, right? Just not, not like come all the way down over your ears. It's not a toque um, or a, a short beanie style. This is a full size hat. So there are things that you could do also when you're thinking about this to, to make some changes. When we get to the chart, I'll, sh I'll show you that. So number one, keep in mind what that what is the yarn originally written for? And then number two, obviously gauge is always important, right? Um, but hats are small projects. So I'm gonna give you my cheaty way of my doing my gauge. And don't ever tell anybody that I'm telling you that as a yarn shop owner, we always say you have to do gauge. When I do mine, I will make my um, about an inch of the brim. I will then grab, um, so several people make these, we carry pearl strings. These are these little tubes right? And they fit right on the end of your needle Boop, like that. And you can slide your stitches right on. It's basically waist yarn, but way easier to work with. So I make an inch of the hat, slide that puppy onto the waist yarn. I try it on. If the brim fits you, the hat will fit you, right? So that's my cheaty way of doing it because I will tell you um, that unfortunately gauge and especially gauge in the round sometimes will lie to you, but this isn't a big enough project to, to really spend all that time. So if you do that one little thing, take that five, two minutes, right? Slide it on, try it on, slide your stitches um, back onto your needle, and then you're ready to rock and roll. An inch of knitting isn't going to take you that long with a hundred-ish stitches. Um, so uh, so that's that's kind of my, my fun thing. This pattern um, has sizes from child to small um, adult, medium adult, and large adult. This was the medium adult. I would say for 90% of us, the medium adult is gonna be the size that will fit really, really nicely. If you have a particularly small head or you're making for somebody younger, make that small. If you're going to larger yarn with a slightly larger needle, go ahead and make the small, right? And because that will help you with that sizing. Okay, um, then the other thing is, I'm just gonna do, can I pin that? Okay. You may not want the hat to be quite as tall as the hat that I that I showed you that I tried on. So when you have a um a hat that is charted, you can actually make quite a few decisions. Uh, and so you can look at the motif and decide if I were to cut out right here to here what would that do to my pattern, right? Well, maybe I still want that one little thing to make that bottom cross. So I could easily say I could cut out one, two, three, and maybe even four, or I could take it all the way up to starting at the bottom of the diamond um, right here. So I could easily say I could take out the first six rows. That's gonna be a full inch. So if I opted to do that, then I'm, I'm you know, I could be good to go. I also have an option up here on row 37, as I get toward the top, if I wanted to make it a little bit shorter, I could certainly take out a row up there. But what goes, what can be challenging is if you are in the middle of the whole thing and decide, oh, maybe I don't want it quite as tall. If you were to take out a couple of rows in here, the pattern would look really, really funky. So do a little bit of planning in advance to decide how you want the, the hat to fit. Okay. Um, I think there was a question about color work, Dana, and, but I didn't, I just saw it spoosh by, I didn't see what it was. Yeah, um, Lisa is asking, can you use a solid color instead of a self-striping yarn? Oh, so yeah, so if you were to do that, then what you would find uh, in this is all of your little diamonds, right, would be one color, 
and um, and your other and your outline and you would outline them and it would be really cool. It would be super pretty. It won't look like a faux fair aisle. It will just like look like a really cool pattern. Um, and that when you're choosing yarn, you really really have to make sure that you're choosing good contrast um, throughout. So if you're choosing two different solids, you need to um, look both at contrast but also at value. So value is kind of the amount of color there is in something. And you can look at two yarns and think that they like um, uh, blue and green and blue and green. So you're like, I just cleaned up my office. Normally I have 50,000 skeins of yarn around me and I don't right now, but blue and green can side by side look like they have great contrast. But if you were to look at them in black and white, they'll look exactly the same shade of gray. So ideally you're going to look at your two, yar two yarns. You can put your camera on your um, cell phone, right? You can put your camera to black and white and look at those two colors and just make sure. So even when, when we were putting the kits together, um, it's you don't want to match, right? Oh my gosh, it is so darn tempting to find this color and we have this beautiful gold that would be great with it or we have a beautiful green that would be great with it. But the moment you match those colors or match the value, the motif really starts to go away. Um, I don't think it ever did it in this one. This one was pretty darn good all the way through. You can see it gets a little bit closer to value when you get into those grays than it is the yellow to the to the maroon. Okay, I will show you one other thing. So this is, again, this is what your stranded knitting looks like. How am I doing on time? I'm doing okay. Okay, and then there's also a um, technique called uh, ladder back jacquard, which is also a stranded technique but instead of having these floats come every um, five stitches, but they, they sort of bleed through on the front, which you can't tell because of this motif, these little guys, this, strand, this um, technique, ladder back jacquard, will allow you to do a heavy contrast um, in yarns with long periods of floats between without bleeding through. Uh, so I highly encourage you to check that out um, to, to see what that's like. Uh, this is a pattern called um, Doggy Love Letters. It's a free pattern I wrote, and it ha has links in there to um, Susan Rainey uh, to, to take a, a class with her to buy a pattern that has a class. Just have quiet. Okay. So, all right. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about is the cast on. When you're doing a hat, you want to make sure you have a really, really nice stretchy cast on. So this one right here is called a tubular cast on. I don't have enough time to show you a tubular cast on because it, it takes too long to do it. So we're going to throw a, um, a, a link in the video or a link in the chat if you want to. That I, I did this for another company for something, um, a pattern that I wrote for Alexander, the Art of Yarn. But my second favorite to that is a German twisted cast on. So a German twisted cast on is going to be similar to a long tail, but it's super, super, super stretchy and bouncy. Because the problem is if you do a normal long tail cast on, even if you go up a needle size, even if you space them nicely, if you are trying to make them perfect and you make it too tight, you are not gonna get that half over your head or it's gonna be highly uncomfortable. So I'm just gonna show you the German twisted. It's also known as the old Norwegian. Um, and so, just a quick little demo of this, but there are lots and lots and lots of um, videos on this as well. Okay, you're going to set up exactly as you would for a um, long tail cast on. And in a long tail cast, cast on, you would normally come up on the outside. For the, uh, for the, oh, it's one of those things, it's like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? Uh, for the um, German twisted, instead of coming under this, I'm sliding under both, coming into the thumb, coming over and grabbing that yarn and see how it creates this little triangle right there and coming through that little triangle. Okay, let's do that again. Coming under both, down the thumb, over to the other finger, grab that strand and you're just gonna pull it till it comes right through that little hole that's right there. And it's very easy once you get going to do that under both, down the thumb, down the finger, through the triangle, right? Make sure you can really see that triangle well. There you go. And coming right through there. 
And it's not, it's, and see what it does is it spaces that cast on and it really gives you like super, super bouncy. The other thing that I love about this, you don't have to go down a needle size to do it or up a needle size to do it rather. You can use the same exact needle size as the rest of your, um, your knitting. And you can actually tighten them the way you want to tighten a long tail cast on, but you know you can't. Okay, so that is again, German Twisted or Old Norwegian gives you one of them. It's one of the easiest to learn if you if you normally do a long tail, um, very easy to translate and really easy to do. Okay, all right. So as we start to get into this, you have two yarns. My black yarn is going to be my background color, right? And my um, multicolor is the motif color. So when you do um, stranded knitting, the motif color should be in your left hand and the um, background color should be in your right hand. And we are going to do what's called two-handed stranded knitting. The other thing that I like to do is I look at my yarn, my unique that came out, and I try to find at the first color break. And I'm going to start my first stitch at that color break. Bring my card down here. I'm going to start on row, um, I'm going to go ahead and start on row seven of our chart. So if you're following along at home with yours, I'm going to go ahead and, because I'm making this for my husband and he likes shorter hats. So I'm going to go ahead and start on that row seven because then it gets right into our, um, our catching floats. So I'm going to start at a color change and I'm going to knit my first stitch in that, um, I'm going to knit my first stitch in the background color. And then I'm going to come in. And I'm just going to start, right? Now, I've started both of them. So once they're both started, now I need to, to tension my yarn to where I can do uh, um, the background color in my right hand and the motif color in my left hand. So however you tension your yarn will be just fine. This happens to be how I tension mine, right? And so you'll now be ready to knit your motif color continental and your, so I'm gonna do three of them. Okay, I have five that I'm doing in this one color. Five, I could choose to um, go ahead and just carry that float that whole length, or I could choose to catch it in between because I'm, I actually like to catch mine every inch or so, and I'm about four, four, to, four stitches, four to five stitches to the inch, so I can choose either way, but I'm gonna go ahead and um, show you how to catch these floats. So once the yarn is in, um, my background color is in my right hand, to catch that float, I am going to wrap my yarn correctly, wrap correctly with my left, and then unwrap my right, and that will catch that float. So that's three, four, and five. My black color, my background color, I will work um, with my right hand. By the way, I'm a continental knitter uh, is how I learned to knit. Um, and so I had to learn to throw to do this. So those of you that are, are um, throwers and having to learn continental, this is one of the best possible ways um, to, to do this because uh, you are whoever just said this. You are literally doing both right hand, both um, uh, throwing and continental. So can you do it just throwing? Yes, you have to do this whole series of dropping yarns. They get tangled. It's a total nightmare. So my recommendation to you is on a small project like a hat, even make the kids try this because it's well worth learning. So again, I'm going to catch my float by wrapping correct my right hand float by wrapping correctly with my right, wrapping correctly with my left unwrapping my right and I'm ready to keep going. Notice how my yarns are not twisting, right? They're staying exactly where they need to stay on each side. Then I did fail to say one thing and I just wanna make sure that I say this out loud. On page three in your pattern, if you're making a medium, make sure that you do that increase round because the whole goal is to make the brim fit and then that hat itself would be just a little bit uh, looser. Um, so that it fits within the charts. But just make sure you just want to make sure you saw that. Okay, at the end of my chart, I'm going to go ahead and put in a stitch marker so I know where I am. 
So again, my background color, I'm gonna tension as if for throwing. I'm gonna knit one. My, um, if you're really, really new to continental, I'm just gonna tell you, grab your yarn with your fingers and put your uh, index finger under. And then you're gonna go into the stitch, pass the yarn and come back through. Into the stitch, pass the yarn, grab that yarn and come back through. I did three of them and now we're gonna catch a float again. Right, and we're gonna do one more. Now, the other thing that I'm doing, as you see this quite often, and if you're new to throwing, again, just uh, if you can train yourself to put your finger underneath instead of out, it actually is a little easier to reach it. So come under and, and just wrapping around. It gets much easier. I uh, still uh, don't do a ton of um, uh, wrapping correctly, correctly and unwrapping. I still don't do a ton um, of knitting, uh, throwing. So it's definitely challenging. Okay, so the other thing I want, want to make sure that I say out loud that I uh, that you're actually seeing what I'm doing is one of the biggest mistakes that people make when they um, when they do this sort of knitting is they will pull too tight. I can usually find a place where I've done it, where I've pulled too tight and you'll get just a little, I haven't blocked this yet. And you'll get a little bit of puckering um, in your, here we go. See how this guy's standing up a little bit up from the rest of the fabric. That means I pulled the float behind it a little bit too tight. I did it right here. This is a really good, um, as I was trying to rush to finish this, I totally did it right there. Now, when I block it out, some of that's gonna block out. But if you do that throughout your entire hat and you make every one of these floats too tight, then there's not enough space in that for it to pull out when you're blocking it. So the way you fix that is, I knit, uh, knit a few, right? As I'm coming in to knit, okay, so one, two, three, four, five. As I'm coming in to knit my opposite color, I'm gonna just pull that yarn and knit that next stitch, right? And then coming across only once, I'm probably okay. So I'm gonna do one, I'm gonna put a little marker there. One, two, and three. Now I'm coming across three um, stitches right here. So if I were to um, knit the way I normally knit with my stitches um, uh, all smooshed up, right? And I were to catch that float right here and then knit my next two, I'm keeping my stitches all smooshed up, knit, knit my next one. Because this is, I don't know about you, I tend to like smoosh smoosh a lot of my a lot of my knitting until I until I don't have to smoosh any longer right and then I'll sort of spread it all out at once okay I did choose to use black I don't know why what I was thinking so see those three stitches they can't stretch past the strand that I have right there so when I'm all done with that those three stitches are going to be bunched like this Right, And what we want are the three stitches to be able to very easily sit flat like they normally would. So if you find yourself doing that, and you might, especially if you've had like lots of coffee or something, just go ahead and tinker back. And if I'm here, right, I actually can fix this little section right here because I can see that those guys are too tight. So I can just pull back on that strand right there and allow it to be um, to be undone. The other thing you wanna do is people can do the opposite, which is to make the float huge. So one, two, three, four, five. So let me just do this. So let me do one, two, Again, I could choose to float all the way across those five, right? Now I could do this and then make that loop really big. Doing some troubleshooting for you. 
Okay, the problem with those huge loops like that, they're twofold. Number one, uh, your pair of fingers, everything will get caught in them. And then number two, those that loop has to go somewhere. So where it's going to go are into these stitches. And all of a sudden then, those um, black stitches are going to be too long and too big. And it will make your whole thing look wonky, almost slip stitchy, but not in a good way um, because you're not actually slipping that stitch. Okay, I'm gonna take those out. And then we'll start doing it the right way again, just to take a look at that. Not the right way, but right, there's so many ways to accomplish things in knitting. Obviously, um, if you have a way of doing color work that works really, really well for you, then rock on, just go for it. So I've stretched out to where I have a nice, not too much, not too little. And I'm gonna put a little marker in place. The markers are totally your body. If you put the markers at each, um, each repeat of your uh, chart, oh my gosh, it makes your life so much easier. So I'm gonna slow it down again to show you this. Wrap correctly with your right, correctly with your left, unwrap with your right. And make sure that you actually do the right thing. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Again, stretch it out, wrap correctly, correctly, and unwrap. I'll do it fast sometimes and slow sometimes just to kind of show you that the joy of it once you get going, it's su super muscle memory, right? Um, and it's not hard at all. Uh, the first time you do it, it's going to feel awkward. Um, uh, but remember, especially those of you that have been uh, knitting for years and years and years, that when you're learning a new technique, you need to allow yourself to wear a student's hat, right, for a little bit, to know that you're not going to be perfect, and it's okay. Um, and especially when you're just a really skilled knitter, that is a hard thing to do. Um, but Doing, learning this technique will make doing color work so much easier than trying to um, than trying to do it with dropping the yarns. Um, and and I've converted many a yarn dropper, um, English style yarn dropper, into doing the two handed because it really, it is so much more efficient and in the long run, so much easier. Every once in a while, I kind of look back and make sure that I'm, I'm right. It's not the easiest, it's not the hardest thing in the world to fix mistakes in color work, but it's not the easiest. So, you know, uh, while you're doing your marker setup, it's good to just do a little double checking on your count. Okay. Two, three, five, and mark. And telling Dana before we started to do this in a group actually takes a long time to demonstrate it is actually pretty easy. So again, I knit my three, I stretch it out, I go ahead, wrap correctly, correctly unwrap. So when you catch a right hand float, um, this is not a political statement. I said this the other day and somebody got mad at me. When you're on the right, it's always right. When you're on the left, you're sometimes wrong, um, is the kind of the way to remember in terms of catching the floats. And I'll show you that when I show you a catching a left hand float. So three, stretch, wrap correctly, wrap correctly, unwrap. Turn out here and I say one more place mark. Okay, did we have any other questions so far, Dana? Um, no questions. Elizabeth just says this is genius. It's uh, this is this is actually the way I learned to do color work. So I didn't even realize there were other options until I watched other people and I was like, oh wow, that's hard. Okay. So just making sure that I'm saying out loud again, your motif color should remain in your left hand. Do not 
change hands of where your motif and your background color are um, because the way that you catch the float actually causes the background color or the motif color, um, rather the motif color to come forward. So you, you actually get to decide um, for yourself in this hat, what do you want to be more prominent? Do you want the, um, the, the outline to be more prominent? or the background color changes to be more prominent. And that's gonna to be totally your call. I chose for the, um, the background color to be more, more uh, dominant. And so that's what I have in my left hand. But if you really, really want those diamonds to stand out, then that color can go in your left hand. Just don't change it back and forth. It is really wacky. It'll look like you've changed colors. Okay, getting down to the end here. Every once in a while, does it go well? Yes. Joan is asking, do you only catch the float at yarn color change? Um, so you're not catching it at the yarn color change. You're catching it before. So we are, um, these little fives in here just say how many stitches there are. And so we are knitting one with our black and then one, two, three, right? You could do one, two, three, or four. It doesn't really matter. Um, uh, with the uh, the self-striping color and then catching that float right in here and then doing our color change there. Again, it's a little bit your call. I don't like five stitch floats. Um, and so I, I don't do it. Um, I don't allow it to go that far because it, I have curly hair and they will get wrapped around my hair and it drives me crazy. So you're not necessarily catching that float at the color change. The color change itself helps carry the yarn along so I'm going to pop from that to doing um, row eight here in one second, where you'll see we'll do an entire row without doing any catching of floats. Um, and we're at a really good time if you want to do uh, the break. Hey, fantastic. Yeah, so we'll do a little intermission uh, right now. I'll talk about our upcoming classes and um, a special offer from our digital magazines. So right now, <clears throat> excuse me, we just have um, one class that we'll talk about for the end of the month, which is the crochet waffle stitch. I'll be teaching that class and that's in two weeks. It's on Halloween. Uh, if you guys don't have plans on Halloween at 11 a.m. Central, you can come check out how to do the crochet waffle stitch and you'll learn how to put a moss stitch border around the swatch. Um, that just allows I, for like a blanket project, it gives it a little more structure. It looks really polished. Um, so feel free to join us for that. I'll drop the sign up link in the chat. And then um, as a special offer for anybody who attends our Favecraft Studio Live digital classes, we, we have a, an introductory offer for any of our digital magazines to sign up for $5 US for an annual subscription. So what that looks like is you can get six issues. It's six issues a year that publish. It's all online. And when you sign up, you also get access to all of the previously published patterns. So I like crochet, for example, I think has been around the most positive since 2014. I like knitting since 2015. And so it's a lot. It's hundreds of previously published patterns that you get access to when you sign up with that introductory offer. And the links for all of those are um, I like knitting.com slash virtual 23. I like crochet.com slash virtual 23. I'll drop all of those in the chat as well. And that's actually, we've got classes coming up in November and December. Um, the sign up pages aren't finalized yet. There's a sewing ornaments class coming up in November. And then in December, a knit, a super easy knit hat um, tutorial. So that one's much more for beginners. And uh, yeah, just stay tuned for, for that information too. All right. Those little acorns are adorable. I want to make that. They're so cute. I love that graphic. <laughs> That's so cute. I, uh, I'm i a newer crocheter. Uh, so. Okay. All right. Somewhere along the way on my last one, I did a repeat of four in there. So I'm going to show you the cheaty way of fixing it when we find it too. Because the when I got down to the end and I had uh, two black left, I knit those two together. Um, because in the whole spectrum, right, I can make this sort of thing happen. If you're super, super particular, you're gonna tink back and find your mistake. Okay, 
So I'm on to row eight now, which I'm gonna start with a two, right? Knitting two and then knitting three, knitting three. So it's basically, other than the very beginning, you're just knitting three in one color, three in the other color. And one of the things you always want to do um, in uh, any color work is you wanna make sure that you are paying attention to um, at what's happening below. So you'll see when I mark my chart, the rows that I finished, I mark in a light color marker so that I see I'm done with those. And then I put something up above to tell me which row that I'm on. But I don't wanna do this because I need to see what it should have been below, right? And I need to actually see that these three um, light colors, right? Or motif colors are gonna sit in the middle of those five. And the three dark colors are gonna sit on top of this little post right here. So that while I'm knitting, I'm not just going to blindly knit, I'm gonna really pay attention to making sure that I'm putting everything in the right place. So I'm knitting two, and then knitting two, and one, two, three. Now I can already tell that I've done something crazy because I knit three. Okay, there we go. Now I've got my two and this is gonna make more sense. So now I have my three on top of my, in the middle of my five. Because I'm only knitting three, I don't need to catch a float, right? What I do need to do is make sure I'm spreading out my stitches and coming through and knitting one. My middle stitch will always go on top of the same color stitch. And right there, I can immediately see where my four uh, went wrong. So I'm just gonna make it, make one, right? I'm just gonna pop down and I wanna make one with that uh, contrasting color. So I'm just gonna make a stitch and be happy. So one, but I need to make it actually with, yeah. One, two, and three. What? But I can't count. One, two. One. All right, that's not the right spot because I said one, two, three, four, five. Goodness, you guys, forgive me. Okay, that's not my mistake. One, two, three, and then switching. One, that black is right in the middle of the black. Contrast is right in the middle of my contrast. And you can see just every single time, I'm always gonna pop those, those stitches down, right? Stretching it out. And I'm not always saying that I'm doing it, but I'm always doing it. So it's really important to just get into that habit. Anytime you're, you're changing colors and you are switching to the next one, you're gonna go ahead and pull on that yarn. Now, what I also see people do sometimes is they'll come down and pull down here. That doesn't matter. What matters is this right here. So when you're pulling on that on your stitches to spread them out, you're pulling from where this yarn is right up to your needle. That's the space that you're making longer. B. One, two, and right there, I kind of forgot to do it. So anytime I'm like, ooh, did I really actually do that or not? I'll come back and just sort of make sure I've spread it out. Right, spread out and knit. So I'm knitting it wrapped relatively quickly. Um, and so sometimes that's annoying for people, uh, but I know that you guys know how to knit. So I'm just trying to um, show you the things that really matter. Um, and then I want, I'm going to scoot us ahead after this to one where we're just going to catch that left hand flow just to be able to show you how that looks. Two and three. I enter the stitch, I pull back, and I knit. I enter the stitch, I pull back, and then I knit.
and to the stitch, pull back and knit. And it really, it becomes uh, such habit that unless you're like talking while you're doing it, yeah, that muscle memory is there. My little old dog is coughing. Right, so automatically knit the three, enter the stitch, pull back, and then work the stitches. And I find that entering the stitch uh, really is the, um, the best time to do that because then you're holding on to uh, the other, the both needle, right? Your, your stitches aren't gonna go anywhere and you have that, uh, that set up to where you can immediately pop in there and work the stitches. I'm always uh, still making sure that as I'm knitting this, that my, my uh, three black stitches are always centered on top and that my three contrast colors are centered on the contrast color or motif colors. Um, two, three. And then Other questions so far? Everybody doing okay with this? Does this make sense? Um, Joan is just saying thank you for such great close-ups and for showing how to fix a bad stitch or two. Yes. I'm assuming at some point we'll get to this other one. Yes, I, I made the mistakes just in order to show you guys because otherwise you know I'm perfect. <laughs> One, two, and three. And notice how helpful those stitch markers are. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know. I met a um, really good knitter and he's out of Palm Springs. And he's just like, I don't understand the, the stitch markers. They just get in the way and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you know what? Rock on with your bad self. I, I, I'm glad that they don't work for you. But man, I love my stitch markers. And uh, they just, for me, they make life so easy. And I don't want to work that hard in my knitting. One, two, aha, here we go. So now I worked my two stitches past the marker and I have only three of my contrast color left. And so right there, that's where I'm going to um, uh, create that extra stitch. So I am gonna go ahead and pop down here. It will not matter if you make this um, right, make it left uh, at, at all, because the only time that, that the directionality of your make ones matters, is when you're doing them in lines, right? Um, and like a raglan. And if you're doing a whole column of them, one after another, it creates a little directionality and a decoration. When you just do one, it won't matter. Make one right, make one left, whatever works for you. Um, so, uh, but you know, to remember the make one right is you, you lift from the rear and knit into the front and then make one left, you lift from the front and knit into the back. Here's my super sneaky way of doing that make one left because I find it hard sometimes to get into that back stitch. So I will put my stitches, my right hand needle underneath my left and I will rotate them one on top of the other, which allows me into that stitch really easily, right? And then I'm gonna do two and three, pull and knit. One, two, and three. Oh, and knit, and I do, I think somebody might've asked me, do I have a different color for my beginning and end of round? I do, I have a totally different kind of marker. So I don't have to think very hard um, about what is there. So, and I will say that because you have a, a, a graph, right? And, and all of a sudden the look of the stitches is gonna be vastly different than the look over here. You, you know, it's not as important, but again, why make things harder when we can make them easier? And now stretching back again, two and three. Molly, Lisa is asking, she's saying, I'm not sure how often you pick up the float. So you create a float every single time you change color, right? That's when the floats come about. So each time, there I don't know if you guys remember, but about maybe five years ago, there was this whole trend to wear 
your um, stranded knitting inside out because when you do it really beautifully, that it's it's quite gorgeous, right, on the inside, and you can still see that motif. Um, and so you can see in here that the stranded this floats will happen every single time you change colors. The catching of a float is when you don't want the strand to be a big loop on the inside, but your color change isn't happening here. Your color change isn't happening until you come all the way over here. And so what you're gonna do is in between those two color changes, you will catch that float. So the rule of thumb is to catch your floats every inch, right? And, um, and that is a, a rule of thumb. What you don't wanna do is you don't wanna catch them uh, too often. Like I've also se seen people are like, oh, well, if catching floats is important, I should catch them every two stitches. You don't wanna catch them too often and you don't wanna catch them one on top of another. So right here, if I were um, doing, uh, if I'd started on row five and I'm catching my floats here and I'm catching my floats there, even though we're one row in between, I still on this one might knit three, catch my my um, float on the fourth one. And on this one, I might knit four and catch a float or knit two and catch a float and then knit to the end. So that you're staggering where you're capturing them so that they don't make, uh, otherwise, if you do it every single row, if I had made this right, right here, if I had done this one um, in the traditional style, and you catch a float right up here on every single row, you will literally see a, a line, a brown line create uh, right where you're catching those floats, right? Because it would make sense right in here to catch a float right about there. So, so your key thing is you want them about an inch apart. Don't catch them too often. Don't catch them, um, you know, too wide. Uh, and and try not to put one right on top of another. Okay, let me know if that helped clarify. We had another question. Oh, Lisa says yes, it helped a lot. So that's right. great. Um, we had two more questions come in. Uh, Valera is asking, do you do anything about jogs? So because this has so much color change, um, I don't. And let me see if I can find my beginning and end of round is right up through here. Um, right, here we go, right there. And so, yes, you can definitely see a little bit of a, of a jog right in there because this is a beginner pattern. I've never done anything about it on this one. I will tell you that if you, um, Patty Lyons has a, uh, I saw it on Facebook. I'm going to assume she's got to have it as a YouTube video as well, but she has a how to catch a jog in Fair Isle, um, which is a, a great video. Um, and so I highly recommend that if you're going to do a, a lot of it. Um, and if you're making a sweater and if you're doing something where it's going to be really, really noticeable on um, this one, um, when I have to look for it, I, I don't care. But I'm also not going to be the most particular knitter um, in this little guy where I'm doing single rows. I caught the floats by, or not caught the floats, what am I missing? I did the um, uh, the jogla single single row stripe by knitting one extra stitch and one color, and then knitting one below. Um, and while that will work in Fair Isle, the problem can be that um, your beginning and the end of round marker changes, but your where you where you work in your chart doesn't. So it depends on how hard you're wanting to work at it, if that makes sense. It was a very long answer for you. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Sure. Other, other questions that I can answer? Um, <clears throat> two demo questions, depending yeah. on what we have time for. So demo question number one, Barbara's asking, can you please show catching a float with your left hand in slow motion? Yes. We're going to do that right now. What's the other one? The other one is longer. Um, Destiny is asking, can you show the English method? 
So Destiny, this is this is one that uses both English and um, uh, or throwing. If you're talking English in terms of uh, holding the, the uh, needle like that, no, I, I cannot because I'm just not capable of doing that. Um, but this uses both throwing and continental. Every single one of us is going to love one and hate the other, right? Whichever one we use. So every single person is going to find it challenging to learn that other technique if you don't do it often. So I, I'm, I'm begging you to try it. I'm not saying you're going to love it at first, but give it a try and see um, how, how it goes um, because it's worthy of, of learning this technique. Um, and the other thing is, this is the best possible way to learn whichever method you don't normally knit in because you are so uh, freaked out about the color away, the floats, the catching the floats, the following the chart, the blah, 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 that the learning of the other style is actually pretty easy. Um, easier, easier than if you were to just set about to um, retrain yourself doing a garter stitch scarf because you don't think about anything but the pain of learning the other technique in garter stitch. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and do some catching floats. I'm just not even gonna follow at any particular line of the, of the chart. We're just gonna go back and forth and catch floats and show you both of them. Okay, um, so to catch my right hand float, right? Again, I'm gonna wrap correctly, uh, wrap correctly and unwrap. To catch a left hand float, I'm gonna wrap incorrectly. Remember I said sometimes when you're on the left, you're wrong. I'm gonna wrap incorrectly, correctly with my right, and then let that uh, left hand just fall and finish my stitch. Now what you'll see is it's not so much caught yet as it's just hanging out over top of that, of that other strand. When I knit my next stitch, see how, Coming around it, when I knit my next stitch is when it gets caught. Okay, let me just get past this marker. We'll do it again. Okay, ready? So we're gonna knit one. We'll go ahead and do four just for fun. Okay, you can enter the stitch, pull back on those stitches, for the catching a left hand float, I'm gonna wrap over top of the needle. So wrapping incorrectly, wrap correctly with my right, drop that let that um, background color off, right? Drop the light color off and finish the stitch. That yarn is now floating over top of my right hand yarn and I finish capturing with the next stitch. So to contrast that, When I catch a right float, I'm always right. Wrap right, wrap right, unwrap. When I do a left float, I'm sometimes wrong. So I'm gonna spread my stitches, wrap incorrectly, correctly, off the needle, it's actually caught when I work that next stitch. Okay, the person who asked me to do it very slowly, did I do a good job or do I need to slow it down more? Okay. Um, while, while we wait for her answer, um, I just wanted to share this feedback from Ruth. She said, I just made three stranded hats from knitting the national parks. Wish I had this session first. So many great tips. Yay. And I love, 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 love Nancy Bates. Um, I just got her knitting California book. Oh, it's so good. Um, and uh, she is the one who's putting on the fiber fair, you guys. So if you are SoCal people um, or drivable to Southern California, like Arizona, Northern California, come down for it. You'll get to meet her. She'll be there the whole time. Okay, catching the left one again. So again, left, I'm sometimes wrong. So I'll be wrong first, right, right next, undo. Catching right, I'm always right. All right, wrap right, or wrap correctly, wrap correctly, unwrap, and keep going. 
So what happens if you don't unwrap? This is one of the great joys of this is wh where you can go wrong is just knitting the wrong color, right? I mean, that's that's a that's a definite possibility. Um, but if you were to um, think, okay, I should wrap incorrectly when I'm on the right and wrap, and you come through, there's no way to unwrap that one, right? So you get a double stitch coming through there. So the moment you do that, you're like, oh, that's right. When I'm on the right, I'm always right. And so you just would come under, over, and back a little. And I think, uh, you know, I do the, the little thing for myself, so I don't have to constantly look up how to do stuff. The written um, how-to is in your instructions, is in the pattern. So, uh, and of course, you have a, a copy of the video as well. Um, but wrong at first, right, undo. Um, but it is written in there. So if you just need a quick reminder, uh, and I know when I first started to knit, I would constantly do little reminders, right? You know, like SSK or, you know, SSK, right? And knit two together or, or knit wise is this way and purl wise is that way. Um, so uh, I would always write out little hints about my wake make ones, um, all that sort of thing. So if you need to, you know, just do right, always right, left, sometimes wrong. Um, and just write that on your pattern uh, to where you can just glance down and remind yourself of, of exactly how to do it. Okay, we have four minutes um, left. And um, let me look at my little thing and make sure that I, I hit everything that I wanted to hit. I can continue to do this, but I'm just gonna check in to see if there was any other questions. Is everybody clear on reading charts? Um, you know, any anything like that that I could help with before we skedaddle. Yeah, a, a couple more questions have come in. Um, Judy is asking, when do you wrap incorrectly? When you're catching a left hand float. Okay, so right and left hand floats have to do with which hand is carrying the yarn, right? So the black is my right hand yarn and that um, the orange is my left hand yarn. So when I, and this you will do, you actually won't do this in this pattern, I believe until row 40. And row 40 is the only row that you'll be catching left-hand floats. And that would be if you are knitting with your right-hand yarn, that means your left-hand yarn is carrying behind. And if your left-hand yarn is carrying behind, that is the yarn that will float. So you'll wrap incorrectly with it, correctly with your right-hand yarn, and then unwrap, and that catches that float. Did you have another question? Let's see. Um, I think, yeah, I think that was the same. I think you addressed this one when you use left-hand floats. When do you use left-hand floats? So I'll do, if just in case something else comes in, I'm just gonna do one more little set. Okay, if I'm knitting with my left-hand yarn, that means my right-hand yarn is gonna be floating behind. So if I'm just, just knitting my three stitches, I just have to knit the next one. My float is, is created and I don't have to worry about catching. If I'm going five or more stitches across, that's when I have to worry about catching, right? And so again, you could decide whether or not you like five, five um, stitch floats. And if you do, rock on with your bad self, this is your hat. If you don't and you want them caught more often to catch a right-hand float, you will wrap correctly with your right-hand yarn correctly with your left hand yarn and unwrap your right, creating a left hand stitch. To catch a left hand float, you're gonna be knitting with your right hand yarn. Your left hand yarn will be floating behind. You'll wrap incorrectly with your left, correctly with your right, unwrap your left. You actually catch when you knit the next stitch. I think there was one more. I'm still confused by something. Let's see. Um, I think this is Ruth. I'm pretty sure I recognize R. Hamilton. Um, I'm still confused about count in the pattern instruction. Uh, for example, row six. Um, okay, so this is a 12 stitch repeat in the pattern. The little number five, all that, it's just a little hint in there that there are five stitches. Every single box is one stitch. So row six, I'm gonna knit two um, black. I'm gonna use my colors, right? Knit two black and knit three in my self-striping. Knit three black, knit three in my self-striping, knit one. That hits my marker, right? And so then I come right back over here and I'm gonna knit two in my black, 
knit three in my self striping, three in my black, three in my self striping, one black, hit that marker and come back again. Okay. Oh Great. I, we are out of time. I know there was one other question that um, was a little more detailed that came in. You can always email me after the class today and I can reach out to Molly or, or try to get that answer for you because that one was a little bit more specific. And you, can, you can reach out to us at hands on knitting center at gmail.com. Oh, yay. Okay, great. Yeah. I'll, and I can include that um, in the recap email as well. All right. So, well, thank you again so much, Molly, for teaching today. If you guys don't follow the Hands On Knitting Center or Molly on social media, um, those are the various handles are, are on this slide here. Um, excuse me. You can reach out to me directly if you have any questions about Favecraft Studio Live. And in the meantime, visit the handsonknittingcenter.com to check out all of their opportunities, more virtual events, um, beautiful yarns and other products, and check out the so SoCal Fiber Fair, which is linked at the Hands-On Knitting Center as well. And all of those links are going to be in the recap email tomorrow. Um, I, I think that's everything. Thank you again so much, Molly, for, for being here today. Thank you. It was totally my pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Have a good one.